apologize. They updated the app for me. So normally whenever I do it, if on the days that I do a traditional lecture, I usually try, if at all possible, on the internet works for me, I try to record it to and upload it eventually. Usually it takes me at least a day or two to upload it and on YouTube, where that way you can have any additional notes, or not, not notes, questions or anything like that. Or if you miss, you can always go back and look. I have a YouTube channel. Unfortunately, I don't just separate out the um, my classes, so you just have to look through it. If I get a TA who's on you know, top of things, then I may be able to get him or her to um, embed them or put them on my fire as well. So the reason why I say that is you may have to look to biochemistry and, and neurochemistry and stuff like that that I've currently got to find it. <clears throat> but this is why the, the book is, why I've been told, that this is the fifth edition of the Infant Chemistry book by Nivaldo. Nivaldo Thoreau, I should say. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully you'll have, and I'll send out emails with the course code once I've got that ready. Uh, once, actually, so I've got it, once they've got it ready on their publisher website. So I go pretty fast on this first chapter because a lot of it's just um, really basic, generic um, information in order for you to get. It's really towards the very end when you start talking about the scientific method that's um, more important. But they'll use some of the terminology that may be new for you if you haven't had any chemistry before. And so the whole idea is that chemistry just really has to do with matter. Okay. <clears throat> and matter can consist of, we talk about matter, the smallest thing that can be divided without losing its identity is called an atom. Now you can split the atom, but then it's no longer have the same identity. So we'll find out later on about protons and neutrons and electrons. Those are subatomic particles, but the atom is the last thing. Everything is made up of atoms, okay? Molecules occur whenever you have atoms that come together. And there are different types, and we'll talk a little bit later in the semester about ionic compounds, that's like sodium chloride salt, or things that are covalent. Those are like your plastics and wood and things like that. <clears throat> and of course, chemical bonds is just the term that's used that holds the molecules together, <clears throat> and there are different types. Uh, then the PowerPoint goes into much greater detail using the example of a can of soda, right? um, which has one billion trillion, you know, an atom is, is I, it's technically not infinitesimally, but it's essentially infinitesimally small. You, know, you can't see with the naked eye, and so there are lots and lots of atoms that are comprised, that are comprised of things really um, you know, like a soda, or even like a, you know, a pencil scratch, which is graphite, which is carbon. <clears throat> but there's be millions and millions of atoms that comprise that little small mark. Okay, and so soda is going to be a mixture. There's carbon dioxide. There's water. There's sugar. There may be also dyes, things like that, or maybe some flavoring if it's a citric, if it has like citric a citric acid in, like Sprite or something like that. <clears throat> okay. And then they talk about the fact that there's a solution. It's called a solution. We have a mixture of these atoms together. And this is why it gives soda its fizziness. Because we have, we have two different types. The primary components. Let me see if I can get this to work. They updated this app. So, see, new team. This is just a figure. You're going to find out this is water. And this is carbon dioxide. Okay, carbon dioxide is a gas at room temperature. Water, of course, is a liquid at room temperature. And so the reason why soda fizzes is the fact is that the gas, when it's in the can or in the bottle and it's first open, it's under pressure. So the gas is forced to be in the solution. And so they're trying to show, it doesn't really show up very well on my iPad at least, but they're trying to show that there's little pockets of gas that's stuck inside the liquid. Once you release that pressure, the gas will escape because the carbon dioxide will. And so therefore that's why it gives it the fizz. So I know it used to aggravate us growing up because my grandmother, one of my grandmothers, she would, they would always, um, she'd always buy like the cheap two liter bottles of pop like from the grocery store and she would always like shake it before and then psh, say, oh yeah, this is about fizz. Of course, by the time it's flat and she can do it all of those and it tastes horrible. But yes, that's the whole reason why it would have fizz 
is, you know, it's under pressure. The moment that she releases that pressure, or you release that pressure, then the gas will escape. So it's what flattens the soda as time goes by. Okay. All right, so if we just look at the carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide has three atoms. So every molecule of carbon dioxide has three atoms. Two of them are oxygen atoms, which are, oh, and I apologize if I get my colors wrong, I have like a color perception problem. So don't be surprised if I call something the wrong, wrong color, but is that like a red or a brown color? Is the oxygen and the black color is a carbon. So it's one carbon that's bound to two oxygens. <clears throat> and this one's actually called the linear formation because it forms a line where, versus the water that was shown before is an oxygen and two hydrogens. And don't hate me because I'm an amazing artist. I was being facetious there. I'm not. Uh, but this one's not in a line. This one's called a bend conformation, which we'll talk about that later in the semester. Okay, so the molecule itself can have different shapes. <clears throat> All right, so there's the water, which they draw much more beautifully than I do. Okay. I'm actually going to and skip through this. And so here's a better picture just to show that there are the little pockets of the gas, because the gas doesn't like to be mixed with the water, the liquid. Little pockets when it's under pressure, but once you release that pressure, the little pockets are released and the carbon dioxide is given off, and that's what causes it to fizz. And that's also the reason why it bubbles, too, is that those are just those little air pockets of gas. I should call them air pockets. Those little pockets of gas um, of the carbon dioxide if we're talking about soda. <clears throat> okay. So there is nothing that you can touch, hold, you know, um, I don't want to say see, because we're going to talk a little bit different about light, but, not, but that's not made of some type of chemical. Okay. So everything, pretty much, that you come in contact with is going to be composed of chemicals. Now, many times, like if I said chemicals in the, you know, pop culture, like what's, what's some of the... First, the, the ideas that you have whenever they talk about a chemical or a chemical company or chemicals in general. What do you think of? Pollution. Pollution. It's so many, many times people just have like a negative idea of it. And it's really in the news this week because with Hurricane Harvey, has anyone heard about the chemical company? I forgot the name of it. It's down in Texas that normally they make plastics. But since they lost the, 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 has to, the chemicals have to be kept at really cold temperature. But since they lost electricity and the water got in, in with it, it got too warm. And so the chemical company, they had to evacuate the town because of the fact they said this is going to catch fire and explode. It had, I know, I haven't checked today, but yesterday it had already, had already had two fires there. So chemicals can be bad, but they're also good in the sense that essentially everything is composed of chemicals. It's just that. You know, in the news, you get used to hearing about pollution and chemical spills or hazardous materials and things like that. But in reality, water is a chemical. So that's why you just have to realize that you need to be um, more open-minded or less critical when we just hear that term chemicals. Just because of the fact that most people think about the toxic waste and so on and so forth. Okay. I like the fact that the publishing includes toilet paper as being <laughs> chemicals being composed of toilet paper. But yes, everything's got chemicals and compounds in it. It's just usually people also think when you hear chemicals, we think of a liquid, but in reality, you can also have chemicals that are gas, chemicals that are solid, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> So the chemistry will explain those properties and how they behave given certain conditions. And so that's what it really studies. We can either do it in medicine, which is what my background was. You know, so we look at things within the living system, within your body, or within bacteria, or yeast. And we're withheld to certain principles for that chemistry and how it um, behaves versus those that are out you know, in the atmosphere. It's going to be different. 
Okay? But the chemistry is still going to explain it. There's environmental chemistry, there's biochemistry, which is my field, which is within living systems. There's analytical chemistry, quantitative, physical chemistry, which is my least, probably my least favorite class in all of my undergrad is physical chemistry. Oh, it's horrible. And so, but there, there are lots of, lots of different fields within chemistry. I did not write this. I disagree with the term, but <laughs> the fact of the matter is, there is a Nobel Prize, the fame of the Nobel Prize. I would not say that's the most important idea of all of human knowledge. No, that's definitely a broad overstatement. But it's the fact that everything made of atoms. And so he won the Nobel Prize for this. He's a physicist at Caltech. And you know that was something that really hadn't given a lot of... Now it seems obvious, but you know at the, at the time, you know people didn't realize that. Essentially everything is made up of atoms, molecules. <clears throat> All right, so what chemistry does is given certain circumstances, chemistry is a science that tries to understand how the um, matter, which matter is just the atoms and molecules and so on, will behave. How will they react? How are they inert, which means that they're unreactive? Are they reactive or not? What kind of products will it make? Like I said, there are different sets of conditions in vivo within your body versus that which is in, you know, in a beaker. So this is where I want to spend a little bit more time on is really talking about the scientific method. <clears throat> so not just chemists, but scientists in general, and you already probably do this without even thinking about it in many ways, utilize what they call the scientific method. Okay, so it's where you take an observation. You're going to perform experiments based off of that. You're going to make a hypothesis based off of these observations. Perform experiments based off of that, and then see how that relates back to the original hypothesis. And you do this over and over again in order to try to come up with, you know, an answer. Like how does something behave? <clears throat> This really is where we rely upon empirical reason, like the rational thought processes versus something um, being more abstract. So that's why we're gonna really look at reason to think about the knowledge that we obtain from the experiments. So some of the terms, like I said, this may be new to you. <clears throat> First off, we have observations. Many times, this is just something that we can use our physical senses for. Now, when we're talking about on the atomic level, like in the lab, then quite possibly not. <clears throat> then we have our hypothesis. Hypothesis is singular, hypotheses is plural. Which is just, I know the term that, like if you're in elementary school or, you know, growing up, you probably said, oh, it's an educated guess. That's probably an oversimplification. But it still gets the idea. You see something, so you, you hypothesize, you make a, you tentatively propose the way that, you know, this works. Or say, like, what if I do this to it, you know? If this happens, then it's because of such and such. Then we have laws, which is where it summarizes a large number of these observations and experiments. And then eventually theories, which is a term that gets misused many times with respect to science, I should say. Theories, which are just models that try to explain everything that we've seen, the observations, the laws, you're trying to tie things together. It's called you know, a theory. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's not factual, you know, but, you know, for example, when we talk about the laws of gravity, it exists, and so, but it doesn't, it doesn't have the same connotation that it would, say, in other fields, when we use the term theory. <clears throat> I 
I can tell you right now, whenever you do experiment, especially if you do this for a living, rarely, rarely is your hypothesis 100% correct the first time through. But you do an experiment based off of your hypothesis. You get results. It's either going to confirm or deny, or maybe partially confirm or deny your hypothesis. And so then you have to revise that hypothesis and go through it over and over again. You know, my old boss used to say, that's the re in research, doing it over and over and over again. And just slightly changing what your original hypothesis was. <clears throat> Many times, even negative results are beneficial. I was going to say good. Negative results are beneficial because you can learn from something not working correctly or something happening the opposite of what you thought it was originally. Okay, so I'm going to skip all the way over to Antoine Lavoisier. Lavoisier is known for a couple of different things, in particular with respect to chemistry. One of them is when it comes to this idea of the conservation of mass. Okay, which I'm really kind of giving away in the, the ending here. But mass just literally means how much of something you have. Many times, especially in medicine, we, we interchange mass and weight, which is a little different. Because okay? in physics, they just cringe if we say, you know, like with my baby, you know, each morning we weigh the baby and they measure its mass, which in reality, um, yeah, is that physicists really hate that because they would say, oh, it's weight. Weight literally means the effect of gravity on that mass. It's the reason why you weigh less on the moon than you do on Earth because of the gravitational pull. But you're gonna have the same ma mass in the sense that you know there's the same amount of matter that's there. It's not like all of a sudden that part of it disappeared. <clears throat> but within medicine, we typically use it interchangeably. All right. So literally, it means the amount of mat the amount of matter that there is in something. And in the medical field, usually when we talk about picking a mass or something, we're really talking about picking a weight. So what Lavoisier did, and what he noticed, was that you can take something, and we burn it, which is combustion, is just a fancy term for that, that he would burn it in like a closed environment. And what he noticed is the amount of matter that you started off with had to equal the amount of matter you ended up with. It's not like it disappeared. Now, if it's in an open container, of course, we got smoke and fumes coming off, and so it's going to, it will apparently disappear, but in reality, it's getting lost in the system. But if it's in a closed system, it doesn't. So he came up with this idea that, you know what? You can have chemical reactions, but the total amount of matter, the mass, has to remain the same from before to after. It just changes from one form to the other. Uh, later on, they're going to find out that you can, it's a little bit of oversimplification because you know we have Einstein and others that talk then about how mass can be converted to energy. So that's when they take the two laws and they combine them to where it's a law of conservation of mass and energy. But Lavoisier is the first person who came up with the, this idea of the conservation of mass. Okay, this is just talking a little bit, and I wouldn't be. Whenever I test, I don't usually, history may be interesting to some, or it can be interesting, but I usually don't test over like years, and very few times I test over a person, unless it's like something that's named after that person, obviously, and then it's already in there. Okay, but it's still important. Not, not to denigrate Mr. Lavoisier, or Monsieur Lavoisier. Okay. So, in this instance, you know, he was making this hypothesis. He tried different experiments, he tried different environments, different closed containers, and you can tell, like, if you take wood, like, it changes from wood to soot, but it gives off, what, what you may not know now, but it gives off water, it gives off carbon, um, carbon dioxide whenever you burn things. And so, you measure the amount of water, you measure the carbon dioxide, you measure whatever amount of carbon mass that's up behind the soot that's up behind. It actually is the same amount of mass as what you started off with. <clears throat> okay. And so that's where Lavoisier developed, this is just an example of a law, it's the law of conservation of mass, which is in a chemical reaction, mass is neither created nor destroyed. Okay. The matter, I should say, is neither created nor destroyed. You don't really create something, even if you're 
Um, adding two things together to make a third, overall the total amount of matter, the total number of atoms that you started off with in the beginning is the total number of atoms that you're going to end up with in the end. Now, we're going to later on, hopefully by the end of the semester, we can talk a little bit about conservation of energy because then there are times that you can convert matter into energy. For example, with radiation. So ra radioactive materials give off energy and they literally will can, some types can change from one element, one type of atom to another type. But that difference is the, the difference that's made up is the amount of energy. And when you add it all together, it's still conserved overall. <clears throat> okay. So. Uh, this is a little verbiage. All right, so once again, this is going off of what we've, um, oops, I'm talking about here. So we're gonna, we want to classify these as an observation, a law, or a theory. Okay. And we can discuss um, the ramifications of, of them, necessarily, you know, like, try to talk about the rationale that's we use. So if we just look at, we just take the time to do one or two of these. It's Dalton. Okay, so one of them is, let's just do, actually I want to start with B. Matter is made of atoms. Is that an observation? Can we see that matter is made of atoms? Is that a law or is that a theory? Who wants to go? Is there one of those three things that we can knock out? Like, it is not. It's not observation. At least not with our naked eye, right? It's not easy, physically easy. Now, if you were looking at this with some special like a microscope and you can literally see, then, they, then you can state that it's an observation. So we get this law or this theory. And we have that matter is made up of atoms. Okay, so yeah, we have this, this law that it's gonna be made up of atoms. And for me, for my exams, if I have this as an open-ended question, a lot of times, explain your answers in a maybe limited space, because then a lot of times I'm looking for the rationale behind it. Because if you said, well, theory based off of the fact that there are certain laws and you need some more detail, then I would say, okay, you get partial, not all credit. That's one of the reasons why I'm gonna stick with this. Then we have matters concerned with chemical reactions that goes back to the Watson. So that's the law of the conservation of mass. <clears throat> okay, then, um, well, we have A and, a and D, which are um, synonymous with each other. But, for example, D, when wood is burning in a closed container, its mass does not change. Is that an observation? Like, can we observe that when they have the wood in a closed container, a closed environment, when the wood is burned, its mass, overall mass, does not change? Is that an observation, a law, or a theory? It's an observation. Like you can literally take its mass and weigh it. Okay. This is just a little flow chart on your own. You can look at it where it just shows you where you make your observation. You have your hypothesis. You test it. You, you formulate it and so on and so forth. <clears throat> I would never ask you to draw this out on, on a quiz or an exam. Uh, you may be able to ask me to explain it, but that, that, that would take a long time to draw. Okay, so the scientific method is not sta static, it's dynamic. It's not static, meaning it, it, it can change, okay? So therefore, with time, we have gotten rid of, gotten rid of, that's for the poor grammar. You can tell them from the Ozarks. We have eliminated uh, theories that no longer are valid. Like, so for example, what you'll find out, I think it's, well, actually, we'll find out later, is when they talk about um, an atom. So we have an atom, which once again is the smallest thing you can have without it losing its properties. And then there are subatomic particles. So we'll find out that there are protons and electrons and, and neutrons and can you go even further. That originally, one of the theories behind it was they called the plum pudding theory because 
that scientist believed that you have this, he said it's like a bowl of plum pudding, and you've got protons, you have electrons floating in it, you've got neutrons, you know, that, that, that was the idea. In reality, and that, that stuck around for a while, but in reality that's false. Later on we're going to find out the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, the electrons surround it. So we were able to revise that theory. Okay, <clears throat> so there's John Dalton. Dalton is the, came up with the, is the father of the atomic theory. And so he's, his idea really comes down to this, and once again, I would never ask you to match Dalton versus Lavoisier versus Thompson, who was coming before. Um, his idea is that you could only, everything was, all matter is made up of atoms. You can't go smaller than the atom without destroying its identity. We're going to find out you can break it apart, but it's no longer a, an el the element gold, okay, for example, or carbon, or what have you. It's going to be its, its components. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to skip over the slide. It's, you can run on your own. So I just thought this one was really cool. So... In the past, we physically couldn't observe atoms, right? You could see the overall, you could see a big chunk of the element gold, but you could see an individual atoms. This is some nan this is nanotechnology here, and what they've done is this is the kind of character for the word for atom, or atom that they've made. This is copper, so it's blue. Copper and like that. It's a darker color. Our single iron atoms. So they literally have lined up little individual iron atoms. It's magnified to where you can see it, and it spells out, you know, the characters for the word atom, kind of characters for atom, which is really cool. So we literally, if you want to, you count one, two, three, four, five, six, so on and so forth, um, for iron on like a bed of copper. So now, we, that one you can state, well, that, that is an observation. But with the you can't see with the naked eye. Right. So let's just go on. So another term that gets used is quantification. If you can quantify something versus a qualification, okay, or quali something's quality based versus something's quantity based. Quantification means you can literally take and, and um, precisely tell the difference in something. Give it a precise numerical number. Okay, numerical number. That's kind of redundant. All right, but you can specifically state something. You can make an observation, something that's qualitative. Okay, this is cold. Or you can quantitatively, like in lab, you know, stick a thermometer here and tell what the actual temperature is. Say it's well now the room is, but you know it's such and such degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit or what have you. Um. So then I I got these from publishers from the previous um, instructor, and so a couple of these other I don't since I don't know what the electronic book looks like. It may be slightly different, like they may be different colors, but he had some. Pieces of advice, or they had pieces of advice on how to succeed. Essentially, one is make sure that you don't. I would say don't procrastinate. I know I'm a horrible procrastinator. Don't follow me. My example. You want to do a little bit of work. Like this first chapter is really easy. But as we start doing things, it's more numerical, and you have to start using algebra and things like that. And then you don't want to put it off. So just try to pace yourself and work regularly. Okay. Then it won't be as onerous. Okay, it's difficult whenever it comes time for exams. I don't want you to have to then sit there and cram you know, all night because you're, you've waited to really, you know, for two or three weeks beforehand and working the individual problems out. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why we have the worksheets as well. Okay. This is the part that I don't know. The, the, this one may, no longer, may not be true in the electronic book, but in the past, the questions answered all the questions that were in blue or in the answer section of the back of the book. Okay, and I haven't been able to see it. And so it may, they may not have it anymore or it may, it may no longer be blue. It may be only odd numbered or something. But at least in the past, like the physical book, 
has questions that are blue, or the odd numbered ones that do have the answers in the back to help you check your work. Okay. Now let's make sure you do the homework. Don't put it off. Try not to get frustrated. If you need to, feel free to contact me. Right now, I found out I got a key now. I'm going to be in mod 21. You just don't want to come out there to meet me because I walked out there today and it's carpeted. There's not even a chair. So right now, if you need to meet before they actually put a desk or chair in, in, in the mod for me, um, uh, uh, once again, you can sign up for my office hours. I'll let you know what was me by Einstein or a code or whatever until they get everything up and running for me and the, the mod. But I'm more than welcome to help you um, you know, work out any problems. I do ask that you don't just come to me and say, so teach me such and such. You know, make sure that you have a specific question. As long as you say, I don't understand law of conservation of mass, or I don't understand how to do this calculation, then that really helps me. It'll make it much more uh, beneficial, will be much more productive. So you make sure you don't put off doing the homework. Okay, then just to do a quick review, in the next five minutes, we discuss the fact that there's matter molecules, chemistry is the whole idea of looking at the way that matter behaves, <clears throat> and that all matter is made up of molecules. Molecules are made up of atoms. The atom, you cannot divide any further without it losing its individual identity. We have the scientific method, which is just a way to address this phenomena. And so what you do is you make an observation. Based off of this observation, you formulate a hypothesis or hypotheses. You have some type of experiment in order to test your hypothesis. You always have to go back, see does this confirm, deny, partially confirm, partially deny. The hypothesis, you may have to revise this. You re-do the experiment, you keep report, you're repeating this until you are able to make your, um, ultimately, make these deductions, these law opposites based off this experiment. So we have the whole idea of law of conservation of mass, which is that matter is neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. So we have the atomic theory, which I shared discussed it there, that you, everything is made up of matter, all matters made up of atoms. It's not like you can't. There's, there used to be this ancient theory called phlogiston, which is that they thought it was like this fluid stuff. It was called the phlogiston. Everything was made up of phlogiston. Well, in reality, it's not true. Completely true, at least. OK. Um, oh, this is just for pedagogy, so we don't have to. You can go over it, the fact that these are for learning outcomes, is what that means. Are there any questions about? Yeah. Um, I haven't said that yet because I want to make sure that everyone has access to the book, and so I will, I will. I will let you know. And my goal is also, depending on how far we can get in Wednesday's class, is possibly even work on some of it in class on Friday. Now we may have to finish some stuff up on Friday lecture-wise and then work on some of them, but I'll let you know in advance, say, okay, we have so many days to do it. Or it may even be that you don't always do all of the worksheets because I'm still, I, I haven't, they haven't sent me everything yet. And so I don't know how many worksheets there are that are all these stuff. But no, I haven't sent it yet. I don't mention it. You know. But my goal is on Friday for us to at least talk about it further into, um, hopefully, do some work in the class. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I mean, well, if you just, I mean, you can literally take a picture, picture of it. And even if it all spells, email it to you. Because I've already had one person email it to me because they were having some issues. Okay, but I have put the link for the syllabus and stuff on, on my fire. I'll go ahead and quickly end class with prayers to get everybody's attention. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm appreciating. Thank you for this wonderful day. For the fact that today is Friday. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for Labor Day. We ask that you guide us in direction and keep your hand over us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> I try to work that into the prayer because I, I have heard, heard a few. Yeah.